if the levees had held, everybody would be fine. People don't understand that people cannot, a lot of people cannot get out of here. Blue skies, and it was, it was just a day like today. It was a, it was a good day, you know. But it was like everyone was scrambling around. People were already trying to leave town. I guess we had decided we were going to leave Sunday. So everyone was just kind of going to the store, running around. You know, it was just, it was like, we had always evacuated before, but we, this, when you watch the weather reports and the size of the storm and everything, we knew this was going to be different. But we, I don't think no one could have imagined that it would have been like, a, you know, I couldn't imagine that our whole, like, it would have been almost like Manhattan under water. It was later on in the morning, the storm was gone. No rain, no nothing. Just sunshine and everything was gone. And they just said, we gotta go, cause water coming. So we just got in the cars and left. The water didn't go down and they didn't have any stores open and it was pitch black outside and we ran out of food and water. and. Uh, we couldn't make it any longer, and then my girlfriend's dad was under dialysis, and he he was very ill, you know, because he was getting his treatments, and uh, he was weakening by the day, so we had to get out of there. We wouldn't have made it. There were helicopters passing by, and they would come down to this, to this wire, and you believe they were coming to rescue you. They would shine these lights on you. It was almost like they were laughing at you. They'd go right back up and just leave you there, and people were screaming. We didn't know they had that many people in houses around here. That's how black it was, and you couldn't see until you heard people screaming and flashing the lights. Hey, help! Fanning white rags and all. If we can see it, I know they saw it. And they were up, and they just kept going. It was a joke to them. So given the direction of the storm and the intensity of the storm, I felt like it was going to be a lot worse than some people thought. Uh, so that was a pretty hollow feeling, getting your family out, uh, seeing friends walk down the street and asking, why are you still here? I always feel like there's a reason why I stay. You know, I don't know what that reason is. This time, obviously, it was for me to be here to help folks, but um, and to be here so I could tell, so I could tell some of the stories. You know, what I mean, whether it be through my writing or just be here with y'all. Um, so, yeah, I always evacuate up whenever I. We went to a senior home a nursing home, and we thought we'd stay there a day or two till the water, you know, we didn't know it was going to be water. And so they evacuated and they took us with them. And we were there for a week in Baton Rouge. And uh, with all the media on the television and the uh, people on the bridge that couldn't go anywhere, and then I started to cry and say, and I still do, that could have been me on that bridge mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for this group of nuns. Right. Mm -hmm. And every time I think about it, I, it gets me. The national government did not protect us. They can get to that rock and build a hospital in 24 hours, and they couldn't get these people out of here. They have amphibious vehicles. We can't get through the water. They land on the beach. Why can't they get through the water? We had 30 breaches in our levees. That's not, you know, a mistake. That's faulty wiring. You know what I mean? That's like, you know, that's 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 that's, that's a real mess up somewhere along the line. You know, if you you know, if you buy something and break 30 times, you know what I mean? It's, you know, it just wasn't built right. It wasn't made right. I was here during the storm, you know what I'm saying? Getting me out them stores, though. I had to eat. My people had to eat. You know what I'm saying? I was stuck in the school with my grandpa for a minute, though. But we got out that thing. And after that, I just went to Houston. And that's a wrap. When we ran out of food and water, um, then we proceeded to try to get out, which was like the, the fourth or maybe the fifth day after, because the water was still high, it was pitch black, 
you know, we had gotten down to the water in the ice chest. Mm. And that water was dirty from going in and out, but we had to take that water and put it into a tin can, which was an empty coffee can, and this is called survival skills. We would light the light underneath it to heat the water and give the children little wash-offs and stuff like that. Like they showed this one young lady with a bag of with bags of shoes, right? And she said, Well, I don't have any shoes. The man says, Well, you got a whole bag. She says, Well, my children don't have shoes either. If you <laughs> if that's all you have to get shoes on your children's feet, what would you do? If you got a break in the store to get food, what would you do? They showed one lady. She was shopping in this store. I think it was Whole Foods or something. I don't even know. And she had taken these flowers. And she says, well, I was just getting some food. And she says, I have the flowers. You think I should put the flowers back? You know, they were going to die anyway. But really, she was just surviving. And the flowers were, they were a little extra. But it's a bouquet of flowers, you know, that she was trying to take home maybe to put in whatever little space she might be in for the moment. But what would you do? Everything is closed. It's four days and the government has just left you and your children are hungry. We just wanted to get to some type of shelter, somewhere where, somewhere where we can get a good bath, someplace to sleep. And however, not, let me write, remind you of this. In the process of getting help to be rescued, we saw National Guard, police officers, ambulance drivers, everyone that had some sort of authority, they were doing a whole lot of looting. They were busting these places like Whitey or uh, Winn-Dixie, all these places. They would go and get what they wanted, and then they'll tell the people, go and get what you want. At this time, we were like, wait a minute, what's really going on? However, I must say, now say to the world, and I, if I had the chance to do it all over again, I would do it again. I went into these places, but I thought about one thing, the children. I got some band-aids. I got medication for children and all this nasty water and what's going on dead bodies, leeches and everything. It ain't looting do. You know what I'm saying? We were surviving. Exactly. We ain't had nothing else. Everything else in our house was going bad. Food was going bad. No water. Couldn't drink water. So we had to go in the stores, break in the stores, and get st fresh stuff to eat. And you know what I'm saying? Live off it. Because people was here like weeks after. A week after. Days after. You know what I'm saying? People were still here. With nothing, you know what I'm saying, stranded, riding on boat to Irma, trying to find the rest of their family, a lot of chaos going on. So we had to do what we had to do. Instead of you saying, I, I can't believe what's happening, I can't believe that it's flooded, I can't believe these people are dying, you saying, I can't believe, you know, that these people are stealing bread, you know, that they would do that. They're such animals, right? What's animalistic about the whole thing is that they were left there to die. You ever saw the movie The Wizard of Oz? And, you know, Oz, you know, it was like this big thing. You know, they got there and then they got, there was a dude behind a curtain pulling strings, you know? And that's kind of like New Orleans, it's kind of like Oz in a way. They portray it one way, but you go behind the curtain and it's, oh man, you know, okay. New Orleans is a viable port. I think 25% of our resources come from this port. If the businesses who make all the money, only hire people at enough hours so you don't have to pay them benefits, and you don't pay them a living wage, somebody's still making the money. Our hotel room rates went up over 250 percent several years. Salaries did not. So the money's a pass-through. We have a billion-dollar convention business, but the workers don't get, the workers should be paid better than they're paid in other communities that don't have a strong tourism community like we do, but they're not. New Orleans had, I think, more than 50% of the young people in New Orleans lived in poverty. But tourists would come to New Orleans, you, would, you wouldn't know that because, you know, that was in projects or in other parts of town. And I really think that uh, the powers that be had completely just wrote that whole group of people off. And, you know, New Orleans being a predominantly African-American city, to write off that many people is a travesty. And it came back to bite them when the hurricane came. I don't believe in that low income, middle income mix they're trying to get, because we already have that in this city. Thousands of houses that people could live in, in neighborhoods. You know, not block upon block of totally impoverished people. 
It does. It is not good. And I say that because I spent 10 years in the project. I joined the military so I could get away from it. It's, it's hopeless. You got to run home. You got to run to school. You got to fight your way through everything. Because the little money they're getting from those government checks is not enough to feed their children properly or to go to school and raise hell with the teachers. Because the teachers have enough to do just trying to keep all these children in class, these hungry children. These tired children, these children with no clothes to wear because nobody gives a damn because they put them in the projects and they pretend that it doesn't exist. The poorer people, I'll say, that did the menial jobs are don't have anywhere to live so they can't come back and work. And so it's just like a, a domino effect. Something has to happen, they let something else happen and all. And today I read how they need daycares for the people who are want to come back and work and they make minimum wage and they have to work but they know where to leave their children so it's, it's just it's a lot of still to be done in New Orleans and they think that <laughs> that we are sin Sodom and Gomorrah they think we are the sin of the world but we are not the sin comes here they bring their sin from other cities we have poverty that's crime but it's not sin the crime is <laughs> what goes on why we're in this state why America turns around and says, oh, I didn't know that was happening. Because they didn't want to see it. Let me try to pull myself together. That's the first time somebody has asked me that question, and I've tried to tell people about it. But that's the first time it's come from someone asking it to me. Because I've tried to explain to people what it was like as a kid being huddled on the floor, watching the house shake, and listening to the sounds that sounds like ghouls and ghosts coming through every crack in the house as a kid when I was eight. And the only thing that made you feel safe was that your father was there and your mother was there. Time for both of them to get to bed. This one needs to get down there. That's for this bed. And the mama and daddy's got to sleep on the couch. Now put that like this. Look at the bag, Ma. Red light, orange light. That's for outside things. So how do you feel about Hurricane Katrina now? Do you feel, do you still feel scared about her or sometimes? Sometimes. Oh, so. Do you talk to your mom about Hurricane Katrina? Yes. And what does she tell you? It's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the teachers I worked with when I worked at Tulane University came shortly after the storm and we talked and she said the children were basically traumatized. That they were almost stuck because of all the things that they had experienced and they weren't able to really process it. So we went in and really tried to work with the children in small increments. We had the children remember a time before Katrina and they wrote about it. Then we had them to talk about how, what did they do in preparation for the hurricane. What did happen to them during the hurricane. Now the kids that were in Texas, they were like, oh yeah, we were swimming in the pool, we were playing volleyball, we went to the skating rink. The kids that were here were like, the roof blew off, 
and the water was coming in the house. It was very different kind of experiences. Remember you drew me a picture one time? What did you draw me a picture of? A Hurricane Katrina. What did you tell me um, when I said, how do you feel about this picture? Scared. What did I say? Pray. And what did you say after that? All right. My son wanted to just keep busy. It was devastating for him to speak about it because it would make him think about his trauma, what all he'd been through. I lost everything. I was homeless. I lived underneath the bridge for six nights, huh. underneath the Causeway Bridge, where water was tossed out of helicopters to us. We were treated like this straight up slaves. Our children were, they were trying to separate our children from us. I fought for my child. I refused to let them separate me. God did not just separate me through the storm from my child, so I would not let man do it. The National Guard stated that the children and the parents were going to go to the same place. However, they separated us. They put the children on one bus. They put on one truck, excuse me. They put the parents on another truck. However, the children made a left on the truck. Mm -hmm. Our truck kept straight, so I waited, and I thought they were going to make the next turn. However, they didn't make the next turn. So I asked the young man, the National Guard, mm -hmm. what kind of rifle was he carrying? And he told me, of course, I don't remember. <laughs> but um, I just said to him, what you should do with it is start putting bullet holes in my butt right now because I'm going where my child is. Yeah. Turn this bus around. He told me, well, ma'am, we're not going all to the same place. I said, the hell you are. Yeah. We're going to the same place. Yeah. So I proceeded to jump off. They didn't want me to jump off. They're trying to hold me. I'm kicking, I'm biting, I'm scratching. I'm doing everything it is to do mm -hmm. to get off of this truck. So finally they made this left turn. They brought me to my son. They came off and they decided they wanted to introduce themselves to my son because they stated that I was a brave mother. And I looked them in the eyes and I said, it was not about being a brave mother. It was about being a mother. Yeah, you was not going to take my child. Mm -hmm. There are some ladies right now this day has not been reunited with their children. They still don't know where their children are. I write a lot of poetry essays and I write performance pieces. Um, most of them are not funny, but the fanatical fanny one, I tried to make her funny because you have to have a lot of humor to be able to live in this space. Please come and have a tour of my fabulous, fabulous cozy cottage. And some of them are called beautific bungalows. Fanny will tell you all about them. Mm -hmm. Right this way. My friend got the coziest cottage this past spring free from FEMA. It's a house on wheels. Some people call it a travel trailer, but my friend, well, he just calls it home. Hi, I'm Fanatical Fanny with the FEMA Fantasy Home Builders Association. As you can see, this hapless aluminum structure is a full 260 square feet, approximately. Here's the parking space slash playground. If you park your car just right, you can open a driver's door and squeeze between the passenger side and the front step. If you don't have a vehicle, you can use that space for the children's play area. If you have both children and a car, well, it has three smoke alarms. Three isn't that intriguing. To keep them from sounding like a three-alarm fire when you cook, simply cover them tightly with plastic bags because it is illegal to remove them. And if you do remove them and your trailer catches fire and you burn up inside, you are going to jail. Right across the nearly two foot wide hallway are bunk beds. My daughter, 5'7", healthy 23 year old New Orleanian woman with all her grandmother's hips and behind, describes what it was like when she climbed in one afternoon. She chose the bottom bunk, which has a window. She climbs in, climbs out. Legs or arms, legs or arms, I can stretch one or the other. Can you spell claustrophobic? Just think. If FEMA had used foresight and common sense, Florida is the perfect example, they could have combined the cost of the trailers, 
I think that's 75000 each. The trailer park fees, the connection fees, the transportation fees, the placement fees, and the 4300 plus in rental assistance funds to rent upscale houses and apartments all over the country. Hey, that's nearly 100000 per family. You can buy half a house for that much. In some neighborhoods, a whole house. And it's sure to live in for 18 months, rent free, fearless pain. So get yours today and live happily ever after. Thank you for joining me, Fanatical Fanny, and the Female Fantasy Home Builders Association's Cozy Cottages slash Beautific Bungalows. See you real soon. Bye. So I feel homeless, and I think a lot of people feel homeless, and I think they feel depressed, and I think they feel miserable, and I think they think, what the hell am I going to do? Where the hell am I going to go? How am I going to get past this and you know you're going to get past it you're either going to get past it or you're going to die one way or the other but you have to get past it but it almost seems impossible because in a way they make it seem like you're begging upon this you know like you're begging upon this trailer and begging upon the female money and stuff you're not you're saying look I had a job I had a place to live I was doing okay and then all of that was taken from me I didn't give it up and I didn't do anything to cause it but it's gone and I'm not asking for much. I just want to get through this and get on with my life. My heart goes out to all of them, even my mother that lost everything. It goes out to the people that build all their lives, they work all their lives to buy their very first home, less on their second and third home, to have it taken away from them. Then to have someone come in and say, well, you can't get paid because you didn't have flood insurance. Or you have a certain amount of time to gut your house out and rebuild. And then you have to build so many inches up off the ground. What the hell? Now, some days you can't do it. You just can't do it. You just sit here. You cry. You watch television. You punch the wall. <laughs> you, know? you slap it or something. Because you don't know what to do with your anger and hurt and frustration and loss. But other days, you just keep working at it. That's all we can do. And it'd be helpful if we can get some faster progress going on. I mean, we need some progress. And we can't do it by ourselves. Most of our people are gone. They know that. And they can't get back. They had no way to leave. So when they got bust out, they got to get bust back. And when they get bust back, they need to be able to afford to rent places. I think about the amount of trauma, you know, associated with people kids and families now, you know, I mean, for a whole week, I mean, for Katrina, I saw three bodies in the same place every day, you know, I used to have to go to sleep with that on my mind, you know, uh, or I remember a lady that, who was asking people to come get to her and you couldn't get to her, so did she make it, you know, so there's so many unknowns, or people that you used to see every day that you, that you don't see, you haven't seen in a year. Know where are they? I think most of the water out there didn't come from the rain. It came from the tears and devastation of all this. What we had to go through. And not knowing when this was going to end. It gets painful. After the hurricane, I didn't really want to, I didn't, I had, I took one drum with me. I left 30 drums in my house, so they were all ruined. But I didn't really want a drum after that. I mean, I didn't really feel like playing music after that. It was just too shocking. But what really got me going again was I went on a, a State Department tour uh, with New Orleans artists. It was a group of Mardi Gras Indians. And through the jazz at Lincoln Center in New York, we went to three countries that had aided the United States 
after Hurricane Katrina. We like to get people involved to drum with us and dance with us because it's a healing thing that goes on when everybody's involved and people start laughing, you know, like, oh, look at that little kid. Oh, look, I'm gonna do the limbo. Oh, look at her, look, look at that, like that old guy who came up and danced. And, you know, just anything, get mad about something. Get mad, get angry, go play music. Oh, this is gonna leave in the next, like, as soon as everything, as soon as you hear a beat, boom. Oh, everything else gone. You worry about the music right now. You floating off, so you ain't gonna never let nothing mess that up, so music is is more than the hell and the me is just a way of living. And we bear witness that New Orleans be the birthplace, the saving grace. It's where the rhythm meets the soul, and it's all right for you to lose control on a Fat Tuesday or a Super Sunday or any day. We say lazy bonton, roulé, or a pocket way, or maybe even baby. It was the music that made us. <laughs> my poetry is, has been my therapy for years. <laughs> um, you know, because nobody can feel how you feel about that certain entity at that certain time, the way you do. So definitely when you write about it, um, you're letting a lot of emotions out. We're using the talent we have yeah. that New Orleans gave us to entertain New Orleans and keep New Orleans going. So we gonna get us, cause I got me. Since we're building right now, as y'all can see, it's gonna take a while, but the orders is gonna get better seated than what it was before. ten times better. But um, just give, it, just give us time. We can get up there. You know? I'm gonna put it in the I just take a wild guess at another five or six years. It'll never be the same again. Though. It'll never be the same again. You know, and we didn't just I've been accepted that. You know, because I am a New Orleans native. I was born and raised here. You know, and it really touches me to see that our city is gone. I know a lot of people relocated and started over, and they had better jobs than what they had here. Uh, there's a lot of steadfast New Orleans who will come back, and they'll probably come back and make the most of it. We are what we eat, what we listen to, what we second line to, and most people don't understand that. And that's why you see more people coming back than they, than they expected. Because it's, uh, it's not just a place, it's, uh, it's our soul. You know, uh, I mean, New Yorkers can live anywhere. New Orleans, New Orleanians got to be in New Orleans. I grew up here, lived here, love it here. It's its own unique culture, own unique society. And uh, really nothing like it until you live with all the people. It's, uh, everybody gets along very well here. It's really nice. I see a lot of things in the news about it, about separations and stuff, and that's really not true. It's really a diverse, great community. Communities work together as a as a habit here. A lot of the communities are diverse, even though they say it's 75% black. Still 25% white mixed in there, you know. And they work together, they come together. They love each other. As far as humans love each other, you know what I mean? So I don't, I, don't, I don't think that it's changed as much. I think that it may be more white and more sterile in the next few years. But I think that when our children come back, our color is gonna come back and our culture is gonna come back. It has to. Well, our children will be educated and it will come back stronger and better. That's, that's my hope. We can, you can't predict it, but you can hope for it. So regardless of what the media says to the public, I'm saying to the public, it can be done. It will be done. We will make this thing. We will come back, regardless of the prices, whatever they do, whatever they want to make this place. They cannot make us all over again. We are here. We will get our city back. We all as will be back with men like us. Thank you.
You are the soul where souls find the soil to stand. Your garden hardened with thoughts of magnolias and bourbon. Seeds sprouting across the globe and even when your bowl overflowed, the gumbo wasn't too spicy to keep us wanting more. So we feast on your false beliefs. Shout up in southern skies to shower us with voodoo and moonshine or the strength of little boys on street corners with Sammy Davis stems pounding pavement while tourists find it funny and children run after purposely unaimed nickel dancing down sidewalk. We love you with ignorant curiosity. Brushing your lips wanted the hint of a kiss. Commitmentless carnivores whoring out your soul for the blooms, beads, and kickbacks. Dreams we lack. So we drown in tears, waterfalls, and floodwaters. Swimming through deception and lies, shoulder high compromise and bring the waters back commissions. But this be Southern living. Them closing schools and building prisons. Confusing new religion, got the billboards to prove it. Lost hearts and heavy movement, but soul, you are worth fighting for. So I give you my words, for you have inspired me to aspire to be just a part of your history. Your memories paved with spirits of greatness that even the great flood could erase. I am part of you, soul, left to die by those on high. For somewhere between the waterline and the color line, I the poverty line, so we stand in line for shelter, safety, haven and overdue reparations but patience wears thin when all hope is done and on the all white dudes from Texas not crazy but I can think of one through politics they stay connected the people unprotected the wetlands still neglected as you get die sticking to the highest bitter oh how I long to hold you soul but arms grow weak like levees hearts are lay heavy with thoughts of tomorrow for the city that care forgot a governmental plot blame the mother nature's fury vision blurry for media blast of downbeat broadcasts of a circumstance they can never understand. No name reporters getting famous off our faults, famous off our loss. Put New Orleans on the cross and crucified. They quickly get the close up, watch your children die. Evacuee slash poet, refugee slash musician, constituent slash looter, survivor slash sinner, American citizen slash great grandson of a former slave. Dancing on Congo squares and raised graves in Tremaine to African drums and brass bands. I'm speaking in tongues with Indian chants. Fading from rooftop to super domes. I'm screaming for help, just craving for home. To me, you are more than just a morning grow mambo. More than black and catfish and gumbo. You are that jazz song I heard and that I realized music could move me. You are the views of Cajun moons mixed with the heat of sexy southern humidity. You are the birthplace of civil rights and the reason why I write. You are the night I made all my wrongs and the more that I tried to make them right. You are the spirit of seven ward hardheads lying on the 17th Street canals. You are the soul of a hundred thousand strong. For the night falls to the east, we bang to come home. So that I won't leave you soul. I won't throw you to the walls and watch them tear you to pieces. I can't give you back to those who could keep you. I will gather your children from across this land. For you are the soul where souls find the strength to stand. New Orleans, you are not just where I live. You or who I am. And I don't know much, but I know I love you. And that may be all there is to know.